Hey guys, welcome back. We're going to be talking about chapter four today. I have consolidated our chapter four notes into this one presentation and added some extra headlines. First, we're going to be talking about um, epithelial tissues in our tissue, the living fabric uh, section here. So we have basic human body tissues. There's four different types that we're going to be focusing on in this chapter. The first one, as I said, is epithelial tissues. So we know that our body is made of cells. And we know that these cells work together to complete tasks and form tissues. Our tissues make organs, organ makes organ systems, and so on and so on to make up our organism of our 12 main body systems that keep us alive and functioning and keep us in homeostasis so, you know, we're not dead. That's great. So each one of these cells forms a tissue when we have a collective group of them that are trying to accomplish the same task, right? So we have our specific tissues that are working together because they're similar in structure. All of the cells of this tissue are similar in structure, and we know that structure dictates the function. So if all of these cells are shaped similarly, they're going to perform a similar function. That's how our tissues are formed. Now histology is a study of tissues. That's just like a histologist would be someone that studies human tissues or other tissues of various organisms. And we're gonna talk about the four main types. We have epithelial tissues, connective tissues, muscle tissues, and nervous tissues. As I said, epithelial tissues is at first. So this is a picture to show us the overview of where these four body tissues are located and kind of what they do. So starting at the top, we have the nervous tissues, which are going to be part of our internal communication system. We know that tissues make up organs, right? So the tissues, the, our nervous tissues make up the organs of the brain, the spinal cord, and the nerves. Okay, then we have our muscle tissue as we move down, and we know that our muscles are used to help contract and they allow us to move. We have muscles that are attached to bones. Those are called skeletal muscles. We have muscles that are part of the heart that are called cardiac muscles. We have muscles of walls of hollow organs that are called our smooth muscles. Moving down from there, we have our epithelial tissues. These tissues kind of separate inside from outside. So like, and I mean like inside of like what is supposed to be within your body and what is not. So it's a nice barrier. So our epithelial tissues form barriers between different environments. They help to protect, secrete, absorb, and filter various substances in and around the body. Um, they are linings of our digestive tract um, and other hollow organs. And it's also our skin. That's our largest organ. It is our epidermis. It's what interacts with our environment around us. Lastly, we have connective tissue. Connective tissue supports, protects, binds to helps other tissues bind together. Um, we have things like bones, tendons, fat, and other soft padding tissues here. So how do we see all this? We know that these tissues exist. We know the tissues are made of cells. We know cells make up tissues, tissues make up organs, organs that we know this, but how do we know, how can we see this? How can we prove this, right? So we use microscopes because we're looking at very, very small things, right? So in order to view our tissues, you have to fix them or preserve them in something. So um, I used to work as a histology assistant and we would use liquid nitrogen to freeze tissue very rapidly. We would also use paraffin wax to embed the tissue in. So you're giving it a little bit more support. And then you use something called a microtome to section the tissue. It's kind of like a deli slicer, like when you go to the grocery store and you get like some like turkey or some cheese or sandwiches or something, and they use those big deli slicers. It's like that, but it's very small. And what it makes are these little tiny, tiny, thin sheets. Like you can barely even see them. They're so thin, little sheets of tissue. And then those tissues, those little sheets that we've sectioned off, we put onto microscope slides and then we can stain them and fix them to the slide. That way we kind of have like this little permanent insight of what's going on in that particular tissue. Um, and why do we use stains? We use stains in order to visualize specific things about a tissue. If we want to stain for the um, nucleus of our cells, that way it's easier to count how many cells there are, you can do that. You can stain certain proteins. Um, you can stain, um, different carbohydrates and things like that. You can do gram stains for bacterial cells. There's all kinds of different staining that you can like look at specific structures because that specific stain is going to target that, right? And then of course we use different microscopes to visualize all this. So we can use our light microscopes used for colored dyes and then our electron microscopes that are used for heavy metal coatings. So up first, we have our epithelial tissues. Now remember that this is like our boundaries. So our body is kind of like a giant meat tube. Okay, if you watch 
crash course, he like equates us to like a little worm kind of. That's true. So like the outside of your body is surrounded by your epithelial tissues, but also all of the inner linings of your body. So essentially you have your mouth connected all the way down to your butthole, your anus, and all of the things that are along that tract are going to be coated by similar tissues because that's still quote interacting with the outside world. So our epithelial tissues, also called the epithelium, is a sheet of cells that covers the body surface or cavities. So we know we've already talked about our body cavities and our body surface is now the outside. Like I said, that is our epidermis. Your skin is the largest organ of your body and that's actually coincidentally our next unit, okay? Um, so we have two different forms of epithelial tissues. We have the covering and lining epithelia, which is called like proper epithelia or epithelium. And we have glandular epithelia. So our proper epithelia is going to be on our external and internal surfaces. An example would be the skin and our glandular epithelia is going to be secretory tissues in our glands, such as like salivary glands, anything that's going to secrete something. Okay. And then our main functions of our epithelial tissues here are for protection, absorption, filtration, excretion, secretion, and sensory reception. And we'll get into a few of those in a minute. So our epithelial tissues have special characteristics that distinguish them from other types of tissues. Um, they have polarity. Uh, they are um, they have specialized contacts. They are supported by our connective tissue tissues, which is our second topic here in this chapter. They are avascular but innervated. So this means that they do not contain blood vessels, but they do contain uh, nerves. And then also regeneration. You know that your skin cells like slough off all the time. That's like what is part of creating like dust in your house, which is disgusting. Right, So we know that our skin cells and all of our epithelial cells are constantly regenerating because if we're losing them, well, we don't have holes in our body, so they must be coming back. That's regeneration. So here's a little bit about these. Um, so polarity. So cells have polarity, a top and a bottom. Okay, you have your apical or apical, just depends on the pronunciation of whatever um, text you're using. Okay, so I say apical surface. Okay, it's the upper side of the surface. Okay, and that's exposed to the surface or the cavity. So most apical surfaces are very smooth and some of them have these little guys that stick out from the top of them. They're called microvilli. It's like little tiny, tiny fingers that stick out from the top. And what's the point of microvilli? Microvilli help to increase surface area. And if you're increasing surface area, you can um, increase your ability to absorb materials. You'll find this a lot in your intestines. Okay, so microvilli increase surface area to help your body absorb things. Uh, better because there's more surface area for the cellular transport to be happening across. Okay, then the basal surface is going to be the lower side. So I think basal bottom and then apical is just the other side. That's pretty easy. Okay, so basal surface is the bottom. Okay, and that's what's going to face inward towards the body. Okay, so this attaches to the basal lamina, which is an adhesive sheet that's going to hold the basal surface of the epithelial cells to the underlying cells. Um, and both the structures, um, both of these surfaces differ in structure and function. And again, we know that the structure dictates the function. So if they're designed differently, it's probably because they're supposed to be doing something different. So again, our cells here in the epithelial tissues have polarity, which means that there's a top and a bottom. They're not the same on either side. Their structures are different, which means that their functions are going to be different. So we also have specialized contacts in our epithelial tissues. So some of our epithelial tissues need to fit very, very closely together to form kind of like a continuous sheet. Think about your skin. There's no open, huge gaps. Yes, you have pores and things like that, but there's not these big separations between all of our cells. It's like a tightly fitted sheet. It's a tight, uh, tightly woven network. So specialized contact points bind adjacent epithelial cells together. We have these lateral contacts that include our tight junctions and our desmosomes. And we've previously talked about these when we talked about cellular transport back in chapter three. We also have connective tissue support. So all of our epithelial tissues, all of these sheets are supported by our connective tissues. Think about like your skin on the outside of your body it doesn't have a whole lot of structure. It's just kind of there. Right, our connective tissues is going to help to um, support these. Right, so you have your reticular lamina that are deep to the basal lamina. So, you know, that's more inwards towards the center of the body. And the reticular lamina consists of a network of collagen fibers. And remember that collagen is the most abundant uh, protein in the body. Um, you also have the basement membrane. So this is made up of the basal and reticular lamina. 
It reinforces the epithelial sheet. It kind of just adds a little bit of structure to it. It helps to resist stretching and tearing because you don't want your tissues to just like, you know, rip open. That's a very bad thing. So that's what our basement membrane helps us to um, avoid these things. And it defines the epithelial boundary. Next, I was talking about um, our epithelial tissues being avascular but innervated. So this means that there's no blood vessels there. Okay, so there's no blood vessels found in our epithelial tissues, but we need to get that nourishment that your blood is moving around somehow. So we do this through diffusion. So um, these tissues are alive because they collect their nourishment through diffusion from our underlying connective tissue. So there's a huge interrelation between our epithelial tissues and our connective tissues that you can see here. Okay, our epithelial tissues do have nerve fibers. So they are innervated, they have nerves. My dogs are being insane. Um, but there's no blood vessels present in our epithelial tissues. So then regeneration, we were talking about that earlier. Our epithelial cells have high regenerative capabilities. Just think about it. Like I said, your skin, you have dead skin all the time. Um, if you really are into skincare, maybe you exfoliate all the time. You're removing surface dead skin, right? So we have a huge regenerative um, capacity here that's happening in our cells, in these epithelial tissues specifically. Um, so these are stimulated by the loss of our apical or basal polarity and broken lateral contacts. So when you see our cells that aren't connected together like they used to be through our lateral contacts, or like I said, the stimulated by the loss of apical basal polarity, if we start to see some of the structures being worn down from our apical surface to more resemble the basal surface, then this would stimulate regeneration. Um, and some cells are exposed to friction, okay, um, or hostile substances or um, harmful substances, anything kind of abrasive, hey, okay, resulting in, in damage. Okay, so these damaged cells have to be replaced, and then this is going to require a lot of nutrients and cellular division. Obviously, we've already talked about mitosis, so mitosis is how we make more cells, more of our body cells. Epithelial tissues are our body cells, so we would use mitosis in order to replace these. So we have different classification of our epithelia. So all epithelial tissues have two names. The first name indicates the number of cell layers. So how many layers are present in this tissue? That's whatever the first name is. Okay, the second name indicates the shape. So how many layers and what is the shape? So first we have simple epithelia that are a single layer, simple, single. That's pretty easy, right? Then stratified epithelia are gonna be two or more layers thick of whatever um, specific epithelia this is. For example, skin, skin cells, okay? We'll have more than one layer of skin cells. Um, then the second name is going to talk about the shape of the cells. So we have squamous cells, and I like to think about it like squamous, like whoever come, like what is that? I like, it kind of sounds like squished, squamous, squished. They're flattened, they're scale-like, okay? They're kind of like hexagonal in shape, but they're very, like, it's like a fried egg if you're looking at it from the side. Really, the nucleus takes up like a little bump in the middle, but they're pretty flat. Okay, then you have cuboidal. Um, hello, that's a cube. It's a square. It's like a box. Okay, and then columnar, like a column would be taller. It would be lengthened. Okay, so those are column-like cells. And the columnar um, cells have like elongated nuclei as well. So like the nucleus in each of these cells is slightly oval instead of circular. So that's one way that you could differentiate between them. Okay, and our stratified epithelial, you can have the shape that varies in each layer. So it doesn't mean that if you have a stratified um, squamous tissue, it doesn't mean that every single layer is going to be squamous. You name it according to the apical layer. So whatever is the topmost layer, you're going to name it after that. Okay? So here's some examples. We have the apical surface and the basal surface here, and you can sell, tell that these cells are just one layer, right? They compose just one layer. So that is a simple tissue. And then in our bottom picture, we have stratified tissues here because we have the apical surface and the basal surface. And in between, there's a whole bunch of different layers. Like if you look at this, this is one, one layer, two layers, three layers, four layers, five layers. Okay. So this is definitely stratified because it has more than one layer. This is just a single layer, one single sheet. So here we have the shapes. So our squamous cells, 
have a kind of like that fried egg shape looking at it from the side so you can see the nucleus is really what's like causing that like little bump here but they're pretty flat our cuboidal are like squares they're cubes okay so this is kind of like cuboid in shape and notice that the nucleus is very circular in our columnar we have like more of a column shape and notice that our nucleus here is elongated So in our thim simple, it's easy for me to say, simple epithelia, these are gonna be involved in things like absorption, secretion, and filtration processes. If we're talking about simple squamous epithelia, we know we're talking about one layer and all of these cells are very flat. The cells are flattened laterally and cytoplasm is sparse. That means that there's not a lot of it. As you saw in this picture, there's not a lot of cytoplasm. It's mostly this like nucleus and then a little bit of cytoplasm on the outside. Okay, so these function, um, the function here is going to be rapid diffusion as priority. So our kidneys and our lungs are going to have rapid diffusion. There's not a lot of cytoplasm for any of these materials to be going through, so it's very, very quick. Okay, um, we have two special simple squamous epithelia that are based on their locations. One of them is called the endothelium, which is gonna be the lining of our lymphatic vessels, our blood vessels, and our heart. Endo is like more like inside, okay? And then meso means middle. Our mesothelium is gonna be our serous membranes in the ventral body cavity. So remember ventral again is on the front part of your body. Okay, so the ventral body cavity is lined by mesothelium. The serous membranes there are lined by this uh, mesothelium tissue. So here's some pictures. We've been kind of looking at like more cartoons that look like this, but then this is what it actually looks like. So this picture is the simple squamous epithelium. So it's a single layer of flattened cells with disc shapes or um, more of like hexagonal shapes. Okay, um, that's the nuclei. And then there's very sparse cytoplasm because there's just not a lot of it. Okay, and this is the simplest of the epithelia. It is literally one layer of just squamous cells. This is as simple as it gets. These function to allow materials to pass by diffusion and filtration in sites where protection is not important. Um, and this is going to be secreting lubricating substances in serosa. Okay, so here we're talking about things that are um, tissues that are located in the kidney, things that are located in the lungs, the heart, blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and the lining of the ventral body cavity. Okay, so here, this is uh, this tells you that it's from our alveolar sacs, our air sacs. Okay, so these little cells here are single layers of tissue, right? So single layers of cells that are squamous. So this means that that's, that's discussing the shape, right? So this is going to um, represent our little nuclei here, these little dark colored spots that's the nuclei of our squamous epithelial cells so looking at this picture you should be able to determine that this is an example of simple squamous epithelium next we have simple cuboidal epithel epithelium so simple means one layer cuboidal is telling you the shape okay that's square cube like okay it's involved in secretion and absorption and it forms the walls of the smallest ducts and glands and many kidney tubules so here's what this one looks like. So simple means one layer, cuboidal is talking about a square shape and then our epithelium tissues are what we're dealing with right now. So it's a single layer of cube-like cells with large spherical central nuclei. You can see all the nuclei are kind of like lined up like this. That's another indication that it's just a single layer of tissues and that they are cuboidal. Um, our function here is to secrete and absorb just different things depending on the different um, organs that they're present in. We have kidney tubules, ducts, um, secretory portions of our small glands, and the ovary surfaces as possible sources of this particular tissue. So this one here is actually in the kidney tubules. So you can see here it's telling you it's our simple cuboidal epithelial cells. Okay, so you see that they're lining around the inside like this. Okay. So you can see that these are kind of cube-like in structure and that's, it's not like this whole thing is one cell, it's talking about each one of these individual little pockets, it's a cell. And you can see the nuclei most prominently on just a couple of these, okay? So this is an example of our simple cuboidal epithelium. Next, we have our simple one layer columnar column-shaped epithelium tissue. So it's a single, single layer of tall, closely packed cells. So some cells have microvilli, which I explained earlier. Some of them have cilia. Cilia are used for, um, it's like a wave like beating motion of like these small little projections for motion. Um, some layers contain mucus secreting uh, goblet cells, which we'll talk about closer to the end of this presentation. 
Um, these simple columnar epithelial cells are involved in um, absorption and secretion of mucus, enzymes, and other substances. Um, the ciliated cells are specifically going to be used to move mucus. Uh, they're found in the digestive tract, the gallbladder, the ducts of some small glands, the bronchi, and the uterine tubes. So here's what this looks like. Again, they are much taller, they're columnar. Okay, so this is a simple columnar epithelium. Again, simple means one layer. Columnar is talking about the shape of the cells. They are columns. So single layer of tall cells with round or oval um, nucleoli. You can see that they're more stretched out here. You have many cells that bear microvilli, which I talked about, some that have cilia. And then there's a layer that um, may contain mucus secreting uh, unicellular glands. So these are going to be called goblet cells, which again, we'll talk about later. Okay. Um, so the function here is to absorb, to secrete mucus, enzymes, and other substances. And ciliated types help to propel um, mucus or reproductive cells by cil uh, ciliary action. Okay. So the locations here are going to be our non-ciliated type lines. Um, of the digestive tract, so such as the stomach or the rectum, also the gallbladder um, and excretory ducts of some glands, ciliated variety lines of our small bronchi and the lungs, and then our uterine tubes and some other regions of the uterus itself. Okay, so here in this image, you can see that this is a small intestine mucosa. So this is going to be a simple columnar epithelium that we're looking at. This is the cartoon version. This is the real version. You can see that it's like these tall rectangles. You can see the nuclei very clearly. The microvilli are going to be these like little tiny, kind of looks like it's fuzzy. That's what these little microvilli are on the tops, the um, apical side of our uh, columnar um, cells here. Okay, and then these guys, the goblet cells, like I said, we'll talk about later. So next we have pseudo-stratified columnar epithelium. Okay, well, we said that there's either simple or stratified. So what the heck is this pseudo stuff? Pseudo is kind of like semi, semi-stratified. Remember, stratified means more than one layer. So this looks like it's more than one layer, but it's actually not. Okay, we'll look at the picture and it'll make sense in a minute. So it's kind of like fake multiple layers. So pseudostratified columnar epithelium. So cells vary in height, which is why it looks like there's a whole bunch of different layers, but there's really not. It's just that the cells are all slightly different heights. Appear to be multi-layered and stratified, but tissue is in fact single-layered and simple epithelium. Pseudo means false. Okay, uh, many cells are ciliated, which I just explained a minute ago. Um, these cells are involved in secretion, particularly of mucus, and also the movement of mucus via capillary sweeping actions. Um, and these are located in the upper respiratory tract, the ducts of the large glands, and tubules in the testes. So here's what this looks like. This is a great picture of our cilia here. So cilia are much longer than our microvilli, which you remember from the last slide, or from the last like actual microscope slide like this. So pseudostratified columnar epithelium is actually a single layer of cells of differing heights, Okay, um, as you can see, it's one layer, but like these little guys are shorter down here and all the nuclei are kind of everywhere. It's not in one straight line. So it makes it look like there's more than one layer, but there is in fact not more than one layer. It is a single layer of cells. Okay, so we already talked about the function and the location of these. Um, this one in particular is in the human trachea. Okay, so that's not your esophagus, it's the trachea. It's the thing right in the front of your throat, okay? Um, you have your cilia up here, you have your goblet cells, again, they contain mucus, they're used for secretion, we'll talk about those later. But this is our pseudostratified epithelial layer, and again, this looks like it's multiple layers, but it's not. It's just that all of these nuclei are kind of not in the same area, so it makes it look like there's more than one layer, but there's not. Next we have stratified. So these are truly multiple layers that we're going to be talking about. Stratified epithelial tissues. These involve two or more layers of cells, whereas simple only contains one layer of cells. Okay, uh, new cells regenerate from below. So they're kind of like starting at the bottom, now we're here. You know what I mean? That's how these grow. Okay, so the basal cells are going to be dividing and migrating towards the surface. Again, start at the bottom, move your way up, okay? Um, these are more durable than simple epithelia because, you know, there's more than one, one layer. That makes sense. Protection is the major role here, okay? So if we're talking about stratus, stratified squamous epithelium, stratified means more than one layer, squamous means that it is our simple uh, little squished shape, our scale-like shape. 
Okay, so it's the most widespread of the stratified epithelia, so it's the most common one that we have. Um, the free surface is squamous with deeper cuboidal or columnar layers. This means that the apical surface is going to be squamous or those flattened cells, and then the other deeper cells are going to be cuboidal or columnar. It's located in areas of high wear and tear, for example, your skin. You're going to want a lot of layers because... Um, you're trying to protect your, your insides, right? So you need lots of different layers and our squamous is gonna be the most, um, the most apical, the most top layer, okay, with our cuboidal and columnar deeper because we have a lot of wear and tear on our skin. Um, you also have keratinized cells that are found in the skin and non-keratinized cells that are um, in our moist linings. I hate that word, but in our moist linings. So here's an example of what we just talked about stratified squamous epithelium stratified more than one layer squamous means it's those flattened cells on the apical surface and it's a tissue so this is a thick membrane composed of several cell layers basal cells are cuboidal or columnar and met metabolically active so the surface cells are flattened squamous cells um, in the keratinized type the surface cells are full of keratin um, and then in the basal cells, you have more um, actively mitotic um, capabilities here. So these cells are dividing a whole lot faster to produce cells um, for the more superficial layers. So as I said, you're growing from the bottom. So the basal cells are actively dividing and then they're sending all those cells up towards the apical side. Um, this functions to protect the underlying tissues in areas subjected to abrasion, high wear and tear. Um, the location here, we have non-keratinized type forms, the moist lining of the esophagus, the mouth, the vagina, and keratinized uh, variety forms the epidermis of the skin, a dry membrane. So remember, non-keratinized is more of the moist environments, gross, and then our keratinized is more of the dry environments. So here in this picture, this is an esophageal lining, the esophagus. Okay, so you can see that up at the top, these are more squamous cells, and as you get down towards the bottom, these are more like cuboidal, but they're kind of like in this like funny little wavy pattern. Okay, but you can see that there's obviously multiple layers. You can obviously tell that the top are definitely squamous, so that's how this would get its name. Okay, so we're going to move on to our stratified cuboidal epithelium. These are quite rare. If you recall, the stratified squamous epithelium are the most common. These are quite rare here. They're found in some of our sweat glands and our mam mammary glands, and they're typically only two cell layers thick, whereas most stratified epithelium can be multiple layers. These are specifically two layers thick, okay? We also have stratified columnar epithelium. So these also vary in, um, they're very limited in their distribution around the body. So again, they're going to be a lot more rare than our stratified squamous cells or squamous epithelium. Um, there's a small amount of this stratified columnar, columnar epithelium found in the pharynx and the male urethra and some linings of the glandular ducts. Um, these are going to be usually be um, transition areas between two other types of epithelia and only the apical layer is columnar. Okay, so next we have something new. These are transitional epithelium. So these form the lining of our hollow urinary organs, such as the bladder, the ureters, and the urethra itself. The basal layer cells are cuboidal or columnar, and then the cells have the ability to change shape when stretching, okay? So this allows an increase in the flow of urine, and in the case of the bladder, more storage space for urine. So when they're stretching, the shape kind of changes a little bit. But this is like a transitional, these are definitely used for more of like a, they can be either, they can be cuboidal, they can be columnar because they're constantly being stretched and lengthened um, because these are very elastic areas of our body. So glandular epithelia is our second type of epithelia. Previously, we've talked about proper epithelia. Now we're talking about glandular epithelia. So a gland, what is a gland? A gland is one or more cells that makes and secretes an aqueous fluid called a secretion. Uh, we can classify these a couple of different ways. Um, we classify them uh, by either the site of the product release or the relative number of cells forming the gland. So if it's the site of the product release, it is going to be either um, endocrine gland or an exocrine gland. So if it is an endocrine gland, endo means in, so this is internally secreting, such as hormones. And exocrine is going to be externally secreting, such as sweat. So that's like on the body's surface, okay? Um, we can also classify our glands by the relative number of cells that are forming the glands. So we can be unicellular, 
one cell or multicellular, lots of cells. So for a unicellular gland, we're a goblet cell, for example, or we can be a multicellular uh, gland and be a salivary gland. So our endocrine glands, endo inside, so we're releasing things inside of the body. These are uh, typically ductless glands, so the secretions are not released into a duct. They are released into surrounding interstitial fluid, which is picked up by the circulatory system in order to transport it around the body. Um, our endocrine glands secrete through exocytosis, our hormones, uh, which are messenger chemicals that travel through the lymph or the blood to their specific target organs to cause whatever reaction it dictates there. Um, and then our endocrine glands target organs um, respond in some characteristic way. So like I said, the hormones designate something specific to happen in whichever organ they are destined to go to. And then once it gets there, it's like a cascade effect of like what actually occurs inside of that target organ. On the flip side, we have our exocrine glands. So these um, have secretions that are released on the body surface, the skin, okay, or um, into our body cavities. So this is not like within a tissue, this is without, right? Not without, it's just outside of. Okay, so it's more, they are more numerous than our endocrine glands. They secrete products into ducts, whereas our endocrine glands are ductless. Um, some examples of what they can um, secrete is things like mucus, sweat, oil, and salivary, uh, our salivary glands as well. Um, and they can be either unicellular or multicellular. So our unicellular exocrine glands are the only important uni, well, the only important unicellular gland are going to be our mucus cells and our goblet cells. Okay, so these are found in epithelial linings of the intestinal and respiratory tracts, and they produce mucin, which is a sugar protein that can dissolve in water to form mucus. So this is a slimy, protective, lubricating coating. So I'm not just talking about like in your nose, okay? Mucin that makes our mucus is a protective layer that's found other places like you have, um, for instance, like cervical mucus that's like leaking out through the vagina. It's a protective lubricating coating. Sounds a little bit um, unpleasant, but it's there for protection. So here's a picture of a goblet cell. It is a unicellular exocrine gland. It secretes mucus. So you can see it's kind of shaped like a like a cup a little bit. It kind of looks like a footprint to me, you know, like the Dr. Scholl's machines that you stand on and you get like pressure points. Tell me this doesn't look like a foot and then like a heel, like this like goes in a shoe. Anyway, it's called a goblet cell because someone said that it looks like, like a goblet, like a fancy drinking glass or something. Like this is where your fluid would be and then this is the part that you'd hold. It looks like a shoe. Anyway, these are goblet cells that have the secretory vesicles that contain our mucin, which meet up with water and then create mucus as like a uh, protective layer for that organ. Next, you have multicellular exocrine glands. Multicellular exocrine glands are, glands are composed of a duct and a secretory unit. So usually surrounded by supportive connective tissue. We talked about earlier how a lot of our different epithelia rely on um, support from our connective tissues um, that supply blood and nerve fibers to the gland. Um, connective tissues can form a capsule around the gland and also extend into the gland, dividing it into different lobes depending on which kind of gland it is. And they can be classified by the structure and the mode of the secretion. So the structure, the structure can be simple. Okay, so in a simple um, exocrine, exocrine gland that has like unbranched ducts, um, it can also have compound glands that have branched ducts. So you can have simple, you can have compound. Okay, in a tubular gland, the secretory cells form a duct, whereas in Alveolar glands, secretory cells form sacs. So you can have tubular alveolar. You can also have tubuloalveolar glands that have both these ducts and the sacs. So here's what I'm talking about here. You have simple, does not branch, and you have compound, it does branch. So you can see all these little branches. Here there are no branches. Okay, you can also have tubular or alveolar. So that's just based on the overall structure. So this is more tube-like and alveolar or like more round on the surfaces. So those are the differences between those. 
Next, you can have multicellular exocrine glands um, categorized by their mode of secretion. So there's three different modes of secretion we're going to talk about. There's merocrine, holocrine, and apocrine. So our merocrine and most secreted products are um, excreted through our exocytosis process as secretions are produced, such as sweat and then um, any pancreatic secretions. And then um, in holocrine, you have an accumulated product within the cell and then it ruptures, such as our sebaceous oil glands. You have a lot of those in your face. Um, in apocrine mode of secretion, you have accumulated products within the cell but only the um, apex ruptures, so only the top portion. And whether this type exists in humans is controversial, but some people think that that's like how our mammocrine, or our, I'm sorry, our mammary glands actually functions to secrete milk. But others think that it's, um, that it's going to be our merocrine system. Even some people think it's the holocrine system. So it just depends on who you're asking. Here's an example of what these look like. So these are the chief modes of secretion in human exocrine glands. So you have the merocrine gland, oh my gosh, this is getting tongue twisting, merocrine gland that's going to secrete a product through exocytosis. So we talked about exocytosis and how that's a type of vesicular transport back in chapter three. Okay, in holocrine glands, the entire secretory cell is going to rupture. It's going to release the secretions and some dead cell fragments because it's kind of blowing up, right? So you have both sec secretion and cell fragments. Okay, the next part's going to be over connective tissues, which we're going to get into next week. Thanks for sticking with me. I know that that was a lot of information. Have a great day.